Old money, that rarefied class of society where silence isn't just golden, it's the very currency of elite existence. In a noisy social media-driven world where too many of us are ensnared in a cacophony of tweets, viral videos and trending memes, the old money crowd engage in a lifestyle where the simple lifting of an eyebrow speaks volumes, and where a subtle nod can be akin to a Shakespearean soliloquy. Indeed, it's as though these privileged few are playing out a silent film where each character understands the script so deeply, the subtitles are meaningless. Thus, in today's video at Old Money Luxury, lend us your ears and eyes as we rise to be your translators in the hidden, non-verbal communication style of the affluent, describing the science of quiet wealth and how old money families communicate without words. In the hallowed pages of old money history, the art of silent etiquette is often more expressive than the most mellifluous speeches. Steeped in the centuries-long weight of familial customs, these social conventions have roots extending back to the aristocratic norms of medieval and Renaissance Europe. You see, whether navigating the elaborate etiquettes of the British court, the opulent salons of Louis XIV's France, or the mighty imperial Russian palaces, understanding these codes was non-negotiable. Indeed, a fumbled curtsy or an ill-timed flick of a fan could spell societal exile or even worse. Yet, why did these societies place such importance on non-verbal communication? The better skilled you were at the clandestine art of non-verbal communication, the higher you were on the social totem pole. Understand, my dear viewers, the spoken word is fraught with ambiguity, and it can be a perilous path to navigate in environments where errors are often, shockingly, tantamount to treason. From the British aristocracy to the Sun King's court, these gestures served as unambiguous signposts of social standing. They not only expressed respect, but also revealed internal political maneuvers and social ranks with startling accuracy. And this codified system of behavior wasn't simply confined to European borders either. It was exported across the Atlantic, seeping into the fabric of American elite culture, as well as finding root in Commonwealth countries like Australia and Canada. And thus, these traditions of silent communication and non-verbal cues are not a relic of past eras, but an enduring element of old money culture today. Without a doubt, these unspoken rules continue to govern interactions within the United States and broader Western society. For example, the gravity of these traditions have been codified in celebrated etiquette guides, such as Amy Vanderbilt's The Complete Book of Etiquette and Emily Post's Etiquette. Vanderbilt, a reported member of the storied Vanderbilt dynasty, first published her guide in 1952, and it remains a touchstone in the realm of social graces. Emily Post, another giant in the realm of etiquette, introduced her monumental work in 1922. Her legacy continues through the Emily Post Institute, founded in 1946, which perpetuates the principles of decorum that govern high society even today. At a juncture where fleeting emojis often stand in for deep conversations, the unswerving fidelity of old money families to non-verbal forms of communication is a sign of their enduring influence, especially when you actually meet them in person. Therefore, they are not merely students of this silent lexicon, but its maestros, orchestrating a complex series of social cues to maintain a level of exclusivity that few can penetrate. Additionally, Europe's lauded tradition of the stiff upper lip encapsulates this idea perfectly. This unwritten code of conduct, immortalized in 20th century law through the United Kingdom's World War II slogan, keep calm and carry on, is vividly portrayed in the behavioral patterns and leadership style of our late Queen Elizabeth II and many members of the British royal family. Their restrained emotional range is communicated not by overt declarations, but by an intricate array of nonverbal gestures. And thus, our first lesson on the art of nonverbal communication is that it is indeed a skill cultivated by the very top of any social ladder. For the higher you climb up the rungs of power, the more silently subtle you must be in order to signal your adeptness at wielding social influence. With that said, let us discuss the potency of something as seemingly simple as eye contact. For its unspoken weight is a keenly studied element of social dynamics, especially among the affluent old money class. You see, among the elite, eye contact can communicate detachment or even disdain, a sharp contrast to the overly expressive animated eyes commonly perceived in the new money or eager to please ranks of a social group. However, Western and Eastern cultures also color this unspoken vocabulary differently. 
In Western societies, sustained eye contact often signifies trustworthiness and invites open communication. But venture to the East, and the same gaze might be viewed as brash or disrespectful. Therefore, while a direct gaze can foster a sense of camaraderie or even deter conflict, it is far from a universally accepted form of engagement. In some situations, a look from someone higher on the social scale can be less an invitation and more an act of subtle and acerbic judgment. A well-known example of this is embodied by the character of Ruth's mother from the film Titanic, portrayed by actress Frances Fisher. In her interactions with Leonardo DiCaprio's character Jack Dawson, the steerage-class passenger, Ruth's mother's eyes become powerful communicators of disdain. From the moment of their introduction, her gaze transforms Jack into a veritable intruder, an entity to be expelled promptly, or, as the film says, a bug that must be squashed. Her eyes become a silent testament to her distaste, casting him as an interloper who threatens to upset her world's well-defined social mores. This offers a stark contrast to Norman Mailer's richly detailed account of President John F. Kennedy's eye contact in the seminal essay, Superman Goes to the Supermarket. In the piece, Mailer practically gushes with admiration at the ineffable magnetism of Kennedy's eyes, defining them as his most forceful feature, laden with a subtle, not quite describable intensity. Kennedy's eyes, according to Mailer, were not merely passive observers, but active participants in the unfolding narratives of the new America. The essay recounts that Kennedy's eyes shifted with his mood, adding layers of texture and intrigue to his persona. In doing so, they elevate him above the mundane, transforming him into an entity both mysterious and fascinating. Thus, in these divergent yet equally illustrative scenarios, the eyes emerge as critical instruments for gauging one's place in the social hierarchy. They either serve to downgrade someone's status, as with the cold stare of Ruth's mother towards Jack Dawson in the film Titanic, or to elevate a person on the social totem pole, as in Norman Mailer's description of the enigmatic gaze of Jack Kennedy. And yet, we can delve even deeper into the silent world of non-verbal communication in old money circles through a discussion on the hidden art of gesturing. You see, in settings where every detail can be scrutinized, such subtle cues can have significant implications, either confirming one's belonging in a privileged circle or exposing them as an outsider. For example, the arts of bowing and curtsying function as ceremonial vocabularies within the lexicon of high society serving not only as gestures of respect, but also as subtle affirmations of one's recognition and adherence to the hierarchical structures that define it. These gestures, however, can become points of social dissonance when participants from more relaxed or new money cultures enter the scene. Meghan Markle's initial experience with British royal etiquette provides a vivid illustration of this. Prior to her introduction to the House of Windsor, Markle, although a public figure in her own right, found herself unversed in the idiosyncratic traditions of British monarchy. According to the now Duchess of Sussex, the expectation for her to curtsy before Queen Elizabeth II during their first meeting caught Markle by surprise. Yet this bow was not just a fleeting gesture, it was a rite of passage, a small but significant step towards her possible integration into the upper echelons of British society. Conversely, for Queen Elizabeth II, the curtsy she received from Markle also held symbolic importance. As the monarch, she embodied the apex of British cultural and social tradition. Meghan's curtsy to the Queen was thus likely less about individual acknowledgement and more about recognizing the millennium-old cultural norms and social hierarchies that the British monarch represents. Thus, Meghan Markle's curtsy was not a simple act of courtesy. It was a silent dialogue between two worlds each acknowledging the other's significance and rules, converging, however briefly, at the intersection of respect and tradition. Similarly, hand movements can be telling indicators of one's emotional state or confidence level. Fluid, purposeful gestures often exude confidence, reflecting the self-assured nature commonly found in old money families or powerful figures. Conversely, fidgety or nervous movements could betray insecurity, something that could have social repercussions in these circles. In the classic film, My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle, played by Audrey Hepburn, is coached on the nuances of high society behavior as she prepares for the embassy ball. One scene in particular showcases her struggle to master the art of graceful hand movements during a dance, for her initial clumsiness could be a social death sentence among England's elite. 
Under the tutelage of Professor Henry Higgins, played by the legendary Rex Harrison, she learns that every gesture, from the way she holds her fan, to how she receives a dance partner's hand, contributes to her perceived status. Her successful transformation becomes evident at the ball, where her impeccable non-verbal communication captivates everyone, thereby securing her a place among London's old money aristocracy. Thus, in the intricate ballet of social graces, gestures and non-verbal cues are the silent actors that can either make or break one's standing in society. Whether it's Meghan Markle learning the subtle social cues of the curtsy, or Eliza Doolittle learning the fine art of graceful hand movements, these small actions often speak volumes about one's social acumen and position. Yet, my dear viewers, these examples are merely the tip of the iceberg. The same unspoken norms that govern body language and gestures extend into other crucial aspects of human life, most notably in the culinary arena. This therefore raises the next question. What are the unwritten rules that govern dining etiquette among the old money crowd, and how do they serve as yet another barometer for social standing? Now in the complex choreography of social etiquette, even mundane elements like the use of cutlery or the seating arrangement around a dining table can become weighted with unspoken significance. The social codes surrounding these aspects are often most pronounced among the wealthy and influential, making them subtle indicators of one's social standing and awareness of etiquette. Take, for example, the film Pretty Woman, where Julia Roberts' character, Vivian, grapples with an elaborate set of utensils at a formal dinner. Her initial hesitation and confusion serve as a tacit admission of her unfamiliarity with the nuanced codes of the affluent. Edward, portrayed by Richard Gere, steps in to guide her discreetly, transforming the scene into a vivid illustration of how mastery or lack thereof over such mundane details as how to behave at a dinner table can underscore one's social status. And seating arrangements at such events provide another layer of coded communication. Conventionally, the host and hostess occupy the head and foot of the table, with guests ranked by social status seated in descending order from them. This ordering is not random. It is a choreographed setup designed to reflect and reinforce existing social hierarchies. However, to be clear, this concept extends beyond mere dining setups. Consider weddings or ceremonial events where the arrangement of guests isn't just a logistical requirement, but also a mapping of social relationships and statuses. The proximity of a guest to the couple or the celebrant can be interpreted as a clear indicator of their importance within the social or familial structure. Indeed, proximity often matters even in the way one arranges artifacts within one's living space and can say much about social standing and cultural values. Family heirlooms, such as vintage furniture or ancestral portraits, often occupy spaces of prominence in a home. And the choice to display these items isn't arbitrary. It's a calculated decision to affirm one's historical lineage and cultural heritage. The positioning of these heirlooms, either front and center in a living room or perhaps in a more private chamber, indicates the family's level of pride in their heritage and their desire to either prominently display or discreetly treasure these links to their past. However, if you aren't dressed the part when you're seated at that curated high society location, all would be for naught. Thus, in our final section, we must clarify the silent languages of wardrobe and attire among the old money set. Now, the social nuances of fashion are not merely matters of personal taste. They are forms of non-verbal eloquence in the realm of the affluent as well. The distinctions are often unspoken, yet starkly apparent. For old money, fashion is a minimalist symphony of understated excellence. You're unlikely to see these individuals in anything less than high-quality fabrics, even if the attire itself appears casual to the untrained eye, with cashmere, silk, linen and merino wool being but brushstrokes on their social canvas. And of course, the accessories will follow suit. Leather belts, silk ties and elegantly discreet jewellery are the final flourishes that unequivocally pronounce their societal rank. But let us juxtapose this sartorial elegance with the fashion choices of new money folks who try to announce the zeros in their bank account as loudly as an ambulance siren. Here, subtlety is often traded for spectacle. For example, we can easily draw a parallel with the flashy attire in the 90s film Clueless, Cher Horowitz's iconic yellow plaid suit, or Dion's extravagant hats, scream individualism and a desire to stand out echoing a somewhat brash display of newfound affluence. In the real world, think Kardashians, 
corsets, neon colors, and thigh-high boots, a threaded spectacle that often unfortunately leaves nothing to the imagination. These are individuals for whom fashion is not just a statement, but a billboard announcing their arrival. Thus, whether it's the curated elegance of old money or the unabashed loudness of the nouveau riche, fashion serves as a powerful non-verbal dialect. It telegraphs social status and aligns individuals with particular societal subsets, offering a visual lexicon that's as telling as any spoken language. Therefore, the next time you find yourself pondering the unspoken social status of the person you're talking to, remember, less is more in a world where people definitely have more of everything they want. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Can you share with us one iconic story from your life, or a favorite movie or television scene, that demonstrates non-verbal communication in social setting. We love hearing your personal anecdotes, such as the recent comments about dating a Kennedy, meeting a Vanderbilt, and working for the old money Grosvenor family. So keep them coming. And thank you once again for your continued viewership with us here at Old Money Luxury. Cheers. Until next time.